here we are for our monthly event with the SDN New York chapter. Super excited um, to, to be here this evening and, and folks joining from all different time zones. Uh, please welcome. We'll continue to have people join as we go through. If you haven't been here before, we are the Service Design Network New York chapter, and we have chapters across the globe, really, um, upwards of 70 different locations. So check out their events, too. They have some really wonderful things that they're hosting and talking about. Really, these groups are to facilitate knowledge um, exchange between not just our group, but the SDN at large. Um, there's a lot of, of event content or a lot of just content in general with the SDN that you can learn about. There are different awards and different certifications that you can achieve all around the topic of service design. So it's trying to grow, raise awareness, and really connect folks globally about this and, and understand how people are practicing in different spaces. And so really to build and enrich this community. And we host events the second Tuesday of every month. And so look out on Meetup. That's the main place that you can stay in touch with all the things that we're doing. We also have Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. So follow us if you're not following already. And we have a website, it's sdnnyc.com. You can look up all the content that we have ever created through events. You can see the presentations from the speakers. You can see any worksheets. You can be connected to our medium recaps, all the things in one place. And, um, or you can also look at our YouTube channel. This is what the website looks like. You scroll down to community and events and you can learn a little bit more about what we host and, and dive into some of those events specifically. Here's our YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. This is where all of these recordings that we're taking end up. So again, if you wanna check out an older event that we've hosted in the past, please feel free. And this is where this will be hosted and it should be up. Um, I'll be doing that within a few days. So you can look toward the weekend or early next week for this. Something exciting and new, wow, what's happening? Um, we are transitioning to a new group of leaders for this chapter. So we had a period of time in which people were applying, explaining um, why they wanted to be uh, working in this or volunteering, we're all volunteers, um, but why they wanted to lead the SDN New York chapter after Antonio, Kathleen and myself. And so we're talking to them on Friday. And so this is a very exciting time for us to welcome these, these folks, they've familiar faces, uh, we won't name them at this time, but you probably know them if you've been to an event in the past. We're super excited to talk to them about what they want to do with the chapter, hear their thoughts, and um, move toward a, a time when they can really um, try to, to run some events and, and we can move things over to them. So be on the lookout for additional events that they will be hosting and we'll reveal who they are um, and move forward with next steps on that. So really exciting time for the next chapter with our chapter. And finally, um, please rate us. We do look at these on Meetup. You will get a notification from Meetup through email to tell us what you thought of the event. And we'll take a look at that and see what you're most interested in. So without further ado, I'm actually gonna hand the mic over to Kathleen to introduce our speaker calling in at 11.30 p.m. We really appreciate you speaking so late, but yeah, I'll let Kathleen say a few words and then I'll stop screen sharing um, and, and make some space for the, the main event. Sounds good. Well, thanks, Natalie. I guess um, I won't say too much so that Arash can actually talk more during his talk, but I just want to add one note how I uh, met Arash. I actually met him uh, through one of the events that he was actually speaking. And upon hearing his thoughts on, you know, system thinking, I was like, I have to invite him to our chapter to talk about it. I, there's no way that I don't invite him, even though he's like thousands of miles away from us. And thanks to him, like, like Natalie mentioned, it's 11.30 p.m. his time. So I really appreciate him taking this time to speak to our community, sharing his thoughts. Um, and earlier, we also mentioned that tonight, we hope to be a little more interactive. If you have any thoughts or questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. And at the end, uh, we hope to have a more engaging conversation, like a discussion. Uh, with the audience. So without further ado, I guess I'll pass the mic over to Arash and he can take it over from here. Hi everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you to talk about one of the topics that I'm very passionate about, the intersection um, between some of the fields that I've been researching and inquiring into and um, today we'll, we'll be talking about systemic design. 
what it is. These are all um, some ideas that I have developed over the years, working at the intersection between systems thinking, design, and my passion for uh, mythology and uh, psychoanalysis. So it's going to be a multidisciplinary take on the topic. I'm going to um, speak about uh, 30 minutes. I'll try to even speak less so that we can do more uh, questions and answers. So um, a, quick, a quick background about me is that I started as, as an engineer, as an um, industrial engineer. And then little by little, um, after doing some degrees. Sorry, in, um, yeah. Arash, I don't know if it's just me. I think you switched the pre to presentation mode, right? For your screen, for okay, your so you, slide. You can see the slideshow, right? Uh, not yet so on my it, end. I don't know. Oh, now it's good, now it's good. Okay. Thank cool. you. Thank you. So yeah, um, I started as an engineer and then I went deep down into science. But at some point, um, I was to some extent disappointed with the limitations of, of science, especially when it comes to capturing and addressing human dimensions. So that was a time that I started my journey into the world of uh, comparative mythology. And through that world, I got to know about psychoanalysis and Jungian psychoanalysis in particular. So I started my journey into the world of psychoanalysis about four years ago. And this summer, I started my private practice. So some days of the week, I write uh, mathematical equations for simulation models. Some days I teach systems thinking or uh, design. And some days I have clients for psychoanalysis. This is a very, very, very different type of activities that I try to fit within a week. To get started about a topic, I want to address it um, from, let's say, um, an etym etymological point of view, looking at the etymology of, etymology of some of these words that we use a lot, starting with the word system. And we all use the word system, but it's important for us to know that it belongs to a semantic space in which we have some other words like synthesis, synergy, and symbol. And when you look at uh, all these words, there is a notion of coming together and creating something which is bigger. We all know about synthesis. You have heard synergy, and you probably are familiar with the word symbol and the difference it has, for instance, with the word sign. A sign is designed in a way that it can convey only one meaning, but a symbol is something that connects us to something mysterious. It's as if it connects us to something timeless. And there's not one way of looking at inter interpreting a symbol. There is multiple, multiple ways in each of which has its own richness and validity. So in this semantic space, the word system also fits. But a better, uh, let's say, um, if, if, wanna, if I wanna give, give a better definition for the word system is that it's composed of individual constituents that once they come together, they take on some collective characteristics that are not manifested in, could not be easily predicted from or traced back to the properties of the individual components. I think this is a good definition. I can uh, really live with this definition of the word system because it shows that when we talk at the level of the system, there is some sort of a wholeness that we are addressing. There's a systemic effect and this systemic effect cannot be traced back into the individual elements. So there is a coming together of the elements and creating something which is bigger and probably more significant. There is the sacrifice of the elements towards the creation of that bigger thing. The, the elements withdraw from the scene for that bigger picture to emerge. And we have heard about this in, uh, in form of the word emergence or emergence as a phenomenon. You see the nature, the movement of the birds, how they flock together and create those intricate patterns of flight. And when we have, for instance, some chemical substances like water, you have two molecules of gas coming together, um, two different types of gases coming together and they create 
uh, let's say some substance that does not have any gas properties anymore. This is also another form of emergence when elements come and then the collective effect cannot be traced back to the, any of the elements. Something, let's say, chemical, or we can even say alchemical, happens there between these elements. We see patterns of fractals in nature. All of these fractals are emergent patterns. Some uh, painters use um, emergence as a technique for painting. Here we have six panels. One of them is a painting, and the rest five are basically fractal patterns in nature. One of them is a painting by Jackson Pollock. And there's a very nice documentary on YouTube about how Jackson Pollock uses fractal or emergence in creating his artwork. We can see emergence in architecture, especially. And um, there is there's a great book called Timeless Way of Building by Christopher Alexander, when he reflects on um, the emergent effect that being in a building um, creates. He says that there's different patterns out of which, let's say, a building or a town can be made. These patterns can be alive or they can be dead. If they're alive, they will let our inner forces loose. They set us free. This being set free or having our inner forces loose or these uh, resolution of the tensions between the conflicting forces is an emergent property of being in those areas or in those, let's say, architectural artifacts. And he gives an example of a room, for instance, if this room has a window place, which is far from the sitting area. So where people sit is, is, is basically far away from where the windows are located. It says that this by definition creates tension inside individuals. Whereas if they are located close to one another, it results in a resolution of attention. So here we can see there is some sort of a parallel between an artifact, the elements, or let's say the properties, or the systems within the artifact and the systems within us. How these two systems interact uh, are sometimes a result of emergent processes at work. In chess, palm promotion, I would argue, is some sort of an emergence because it's not the last step that the, that the pawn takes. It just takes one step at a time and then suddenly it becomes something bigger or more significant as a piece. It can be something like a bishop or uh, anything else which is more important than a pawn in chess. So this is also some sort of an emergent process. Now, we see it in works of art as well. If you look at a painting and it gives us a soothing effect, it's because the, let's say, elements within that painting are standing in equilibrium and harmony. So the harmony that exists within the painting, within the forces inside that uh, painting, somehow creates the harmony within us, the onlookers who are being aesthetically arrested by the equilibrium between these forces. One good example that I uh, like to give is the usage of emergence in education. There's a talk by Russell Acuff, a great systems thinker. He says that there was an area in which there was a problem with literacy. And um, the population in that area didn't have basically a culture for writing and reading. Uh, things were more oral. They would just speak it out, talk in communities and so on and so forth. And Therefore, the students in the school were suffering. They didn't have this culture of carrying books and reading, exchanging books, talking about books. Whatever they tried to do in the form of the classes failed. And one intervention that they designed was that they took one of the auditoriums in the school and they started uh, showing, screening Charles Chaplin's movies all the time. After, after some months, the literacy rate improved. And the reason why was that they wanted to be able to read the panels. Students wanted to read the captions. So, you know, it was a long thing. They didn't need to basically read from the beginning, but at some point there were just like five or six captions throughout the movie and they were key. They wanted to understand what happened. So this is designed by emergence, I would say. This is designing uh, for increase in the literacy rate, but not addressing it directly in settings, especially when there is cultural impediments, 
but by somehow uh, going towards it or circumambulating it in a way, in an emergent way, generating that, that effect. I've been trying a lot of emergent processes in my teaching. I, I do not tell the students what to use for presentations as long as they can convey their ideas. I don't, I don't use PowerPoint myself, especially uh, only if I'm making presentations like this, but in teaching, I never use slides. And then the students bring, you know, this is a class of mine where students brought boxes within boxes within boxes to show their ideas that what they have learned from the class. The moment you give the system a little bit of room to wiggle and you loosen down the rules, um, then it somehow allows for creativity to flourish and you can tap into the richness. Another thing I use a lot of games for teaching and um, with, with the students and Sometimes they also start using games for their presentations. They use me as an object of those games. Right? It's sometimes you know it goes out of control. You know the, the way they can students can take it to the next level. But these are all emergent processes that I've used in um, basically ideas that I've had over years for education. Now some questions for you is that what type of emergencies do we experience on a daily basis? Emergence happens at the level of the system, not at the level of the elements. Most of the times when we ask someone what this system is, they talk about the elements of it, what the system is made of, or the function of the system, what the function does. But that is not how we relate to systems around us. We relate to systems in an emergent way. A lot of important, let's say, attributes or properties in our lives are emergent. Human reputation, for instance, this is an emergent property. Now, trust is an emergent property. I think for us, we need to start thinking in terms of designing for emergent behavior in systems and in services. And this will be a fundament for systemic design. Because when we were talking about systemic design, if we just keep on talking about features of a service, that is not designing for emergence. We are still talking at the level of the elements. We need to be able to connect to the service at the level of the whole. And that is the uh, imperative for designing for emergence. And this also ties back to the idea of phenomenology, which is everything but the thing itself. So the phenomenology of a service is everything, every type of impression, every type of assumption, any type of, let's say, action or readiness for manifesting some sort of psychological disposition that the users walk away from the service with when they interact with the service. It's not about the elements of the service. It's not about the touch points. It's not about the features. It's understanding services at the level of the emergent properties that they create, going beyond and above the elements and seeing the systemic, uh, let's say, effects that a service generates. So this is the first fundament of systemic design, understanding really systems in terms of the emergence they create. The next one for me is getting a little bit more specific about the word design itself. Once we look at the root word for the word design, we see that it shares its, its root with significance. In French, we say signification, which means meaning. There is something about signature, significance, meaning. There is a subjective human dimension to design that we should not uh, gloss over. It's something that is super important to be taken into account when we think about design. And what do we mean by this? So when we're talking about design or uh, let's say systemic design, we're thinking more about human activity systems. These are systems in which perception of human beings play a role. How people or humans perceive something and how attribute meanings, how they attribute meanings to those perceptions, it plays a role in the state of the system. So looking at a service mechanistically, in my opinion, it takes us a little bit away from these human dimensions that exist within the system. Understanding the worldviews of the individuals understanding the different, uh, let's say, means of creating meaning for the individuals through the service. These are the things that need to be taken into account. But we see most of the methodologies that we have somehow come from 
the let's say paradigm of industrial design design in which we were designing physical artifacts. So we, if you think, for instance, about service blueprints, one of the tools that are used, blueprint, the word blueprint is a technical drawing. This metaphor that we are using somehow ties us back with that mechanistic or physical paradigm of design. In the new paradigm, paradigm of design, we can call systemic design, we need to tap into those elements that create significance, subjectivity, and meaning for individuals. Another uh, great source for you is a book written by David Bohm, the um, quantum physicist who towards the later phase of his life moved away from technicalities and into uh, profundities and wrote a book called On Dialogue, amazing book, is that whenever we are looking at something, it's our assumptions that are looking. So we, every individual has some set of assumptions, some set of worldviews, some set of mental models operating principles based on which they make observations and they somehow translate those observations, meanings and they act upon those meanings. And he says that we should keep in mind that those assumptions are looking and those assumptions are not being looked at. So this is an important thing that um, we need to remember that um, we need to tap into the mental models and into assumptions of some sort, go a layer below, let's say the normal, uh, let's say the needs or the wants of the individuals and look into their fundamental assumptions that shape those needs or wants and what, uh, what other can somehow manifest from those assumptions as well. Um, and finally, some other ideas for you here from another book that's, you know, one suggestion I always uh, give to my students is that if you wanna learn systems thinking, if you want to learn design thinking, stop reading any book which has the name systems thinking or design thinking in its title. That is just keeping you in, in a limited space in terms of creativity and learning. And I've learned so much from reading novels and other books about design and about systems thinking. And um, here's a here's a part from a book is one of my favorites. It's called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It's not about really motorcycle maintenance, near uh, about Zen. Uh, there's a lot of philosophical statements and ideas there. And here uh, the author is arguing that if a factory is torn down by the rationality with which it was created, it is left standing, that rationality would create another factory. So this is again, this idea of subjectivity of individuals, the way they look at things that those are basically what makes us human beings. And if you're talking about design, we need to be somehow close to those things. And he talks about a motorcycle at some point. He says a motorcycle is a system of ideas and concepts carved out of steel. That's what it is. Every part in the motorcycle is an idea. So seeing beyond those, let's say, physical uh, components is an important task again, seeing the ideas that produce them and where those ideas come from originally. That was the second bit here that I wanted to share with you and some questions for that. Can we, how can designing result in a deeper understanding of the human conditions of users and designers? There is, and um, for me, it's really an unfair bias towards understanding the users and customers and no one talks much about when you're saying the designers, the compatibility of the design artifact with the designer is not much looked into. And in my opinion is much more important than looking out to see if this artifact is compatible with users or not. Because if that resonance does not exist between the designer and the artifact, that other resonance probably will never be created. So there is at, at a deeper level, of course, but there is something about human conditions of users and designers that need to be understood, need to be tapped into. Fortunately for, for the customers, we also look at them at a very superficial level. We, we scratch them on the surface by creating the customer personas. And um, in my opinion, that only have some sort of a commercial agenda, uh, nothing beyond that. We don't have a genuine interest in human, basically in design. And this is something we talk about human-centered design, but in my opinion, is not yet uh, real, genuinely uh, human-centered. So that's one idea. And how can designing become 
an odyssey of transforming worldviews and mental models of users and designers. How can it be an odyssey of transforming mental models? This is another question. And last bit that I want to talk about is putting these two together that we talked about so far. We can create systematic or systemic design. So they both have the same terminologies. In it. So there is something about these that are very different. In my opinion, systematic design is designing new problems. Systematic design, and we are familiar with systematic design, all these tools that we use, they are systematic. A systematic procedure is an orderly sequence of activities. It's logical and it moves, it marches from left to right. Sometimes there's a feedback, it comes back. But all these templates, all these, let's say, process steps that we use are systematic. They're not systemic. And they are good for problem solving, probably, that you start with the definition of a problem and then you take it on, but they're not used, in my opinion, for systemic design. Now, systemic design is when you dissolve a problem. So it's not about solving the problems, it's about dissolving problems. It's basically redesigning the system that has the problem so that the problem no longer exists. This is what systemic design is about. It's not about going after the problem and chasing it, solving it, creating some other, pushing it into some other areas. It's about redesigning of the system that has the problem so that the problem disappears and the problem dissolves. Systemic design is basically about a transcendence. It's about going above and beyond the boundaries of the existing system, redefining the system in a way, creating a new system. It's not about moving within the constraints and within, let's say, those um, processes that are already established. That is problem solving, that is not design. And finally, systemic design is about questioning the problems and questioning the perspective or digging deep into the perspective or the, or, or the world view from which the problem comes from. So this, when we, once we do this and we start working with that, those mental models, then we are getting closer and closer to systemic design than systematic design. And some ideas for you to, to understand this, this is um, the last bit that I want to share with you here, just to give you a better understanding of this. Why do we have this bias towards systematic processes and systemic ones? Um, Generally speaking, there's two different types of objects. You know, if you, if you look at um, the psychic structure, we have inner objects and we have outer objects. We are very good in the world of outer, outer objects. You know, we can name a lot of them. A computer, a course, is an outer object. A molecule, a baseball bat, a building, a job position somewhere, you know, a company enterprise, a design project. These are all outer objects. But then we have, on the other hand, we have the inner objects. Inner objects are things like dreams, fantasies, visions, symbols, emotions, ideals, and ideas. So these are the world of inner objects. So our perception system should somehow comprehend the contents of outer objects as well as inner objects. But we have such a big bias towards the world of outer objects. And um, here is um, a painting from early 16th century that shows two French ambassadors. And you can see this obsession with the outer objects here in this painting that they have gathered all these elements. You know, some of them are scientific, some of them show wealth of some sort. And uh, it's just, a, it, there's not even an inch of this painting that is not covered by an outer object. And these days we have outer objects of different types. If you look at some LinkedIn profiles, you see the list of outer objects that are somehow uh, lined up there. You don't, you still, you, you really have no, have no idea what individuals are capable of. You just list of all these things that are about the outer world, about um, developing an understanding of the things that are out there and very proudly you align them together. But there is a world of inner objects. And that is a world from which design ideas come from. That is the world, according to David Lynch, where you can um, catch big fish. So that's the world of inner objects. This is 
um, a segment from Amazon letter to shareholders in 2018. But there they say that there is two processes in business. Sometimes you can be efficient and you know where you're going, but then sometimes you need to wonder. This wondering is a healthy counterbalance to efficiency. It is very much needed. It is not random. It's somehow guided by something. It's not as tangible as efficiency seeking processes, but still it's something that is guided by, by some sort of a mysterious, let's say, thread. And they say that all the outsized discoveries and the ones that um, are not the normal ones, they come out of the process of wandering. They require this wandering. And this wandering means that you need to be in touch with those world of inner objects. That's this wandering means that we need to channel or tune in to our intuition. So this is where these ideas come from. This is the world of inner objects. It's our intuition that connects us to the world of inner objects. Whereas our sensation, our sensory perceptions connect us to the world of outer objects. So we need to comprehend the contents of basically those objects or systemic design because systemic design is not a systematic process of following process steps. It's something that is very human, it's something that wants to tap into some deep processes that are transformative and they transcend what exists. There needs to be some high level of creativity in such, uh, let's say, undertakings. And in this, to, for this to happen, you need to be able to hold the tensions because in um, efficiency seeking processes or let's say vertical thinking, you need to be right at every step. But in lateral thinking or this connection to the world of inner objects, you need to just generate alternative ideas, float with them, you know, and be okay to continue that process until a piece comes and completes basically the image. Suddenly things emerge as well. You know, those of you who, who write, you know that you cannot follow formulas for writing. Those, those of you who create music, you know that you need to allow for things to be channeled from within. And this dimension is, is lacking in a, in a major way in design. You know, in my opinion, systemic design is a conduit or design should be a conduit for uh, creativity and uh, for intuition of the designer so that it can generate those transformative effects. And finally, in mythology, there is a lot of references to wandering. And there, there are a lot of mythical figures that go on and wander for a while. You know, one of them is the case of the wanderings of Gilgamesh. This is one of the first epics known to the human being about 2,000 2, years uh, before common era. And uh, there, you know, after Gilgamesh loses his uh, friend Ankido, he goes on wandering. The same happened to Carl Gustav Jung. He went for wandering after his separation with, with Freud. You know, he, he left out and he went into a chaotic search out of which most of his um, theories and the concepts that underpin his theories emerged. So this is basically the ideas, a piece of poem for you to um, somehow connect us back to this mythopoetic dimension. Um, there's a lot we can learn from poems. And, and T.S. Eliot is a poet uh, from which I've learned a lot. And this is a beautiful piece by him. He says, we shall not cease from exploration. And at the end of all um, our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So this process of wandering and exploration is also present there. William Blake, believe, you, believe it or not, talks about systemic design. He, he says that I must create a system or be enslaved by another man's. I will not reason and compare it my business is to create. So this is basically the, uh, the tenets of systemic design. We're not going to compare and use a lot of logic for problem solving and stuff. Here we are for creativity. And this to me should be um, embodied through the process of systemic design. And um, 
just a brief note about what I do, apart from the activities that I do at universities where I teach and consulting activities I have with my friend Peter Orweth, um, a training company called, training consulting company called Design Dissolve, and we specialize in systemic design. This is what we are uh, basically passionate about. Uh, about. And um, we have some sort of, some certain assumptions um, for the courses that we have. Our courses are, have been started um, at the beginning of this year. And in about 10 months, we've had people from all six continents, um, different countries and different company sizes, coaches, independents, people working for IBM, Google, Facebook. And it's a great mix of people that have been uh, fortunately attracted to these courses. But we have some certain assumptions here. We say think thinking is not synonymous with analysis. So we want to explore the thinking space, but not only analytical thinking. There's other forms of thing like synthetic thinking, lateral thinking, and feedback thinking. And then we say thinking is one of the functions of our consciousness. We need to tap into other functions as well that are intuition, feeling, and sensation. And finally, consciousness is only a small part of our psyche. We have a lot of unconscious processes. And those are where the sources of creativity and those outside discoveries and ideas are. So tapping into unconscious process. Based on this, we design our courses. We have courses that can help us understand the thinking space, courses that can help us understand and connect to our feelings, our uh, sensation, intuition, as well as our thinking. And finally, courses that can uh, guide us into this world of unconscious processes. So call them systems thinking, design beyond thinking. So it's not even beyond design thinking, it's design beyond thinking. And finally, disciplined imagination. And if you're interested, you can see our website, but we have two courses starting. CET times, yeah, it's 6 p.m. starting um, in Europe, Europe, European time till, um, till eight. We have two courses starting. One of them is about systems thinking towards the end of October. And one of them is about um, designing for resonance, which ties back into understanding the functions of our consciousness. I'll uh, pass the links down to Kathleen and um, she will be kindly uh, sharing these links with you. And this is our advanced program. It's our tagline is exploring and expanding the human potential. And we have also an, um, a very uh, short webinar, one hour webinar the day after tomorrow, it's free of charge, you can um, attend. It's about the parallels between the mythic journey of a hero and the design, the journey of a designer. So we just somehow plagiarized the title of 2001 Space Odyssey, probably 2021, the design odysseys. And so it's some mythical ideas, some ideas for, from mythologies, timeless dimension for designers. And in end of November, I'll be giving a course with a Service Design Network. And I call it Introduction to Systemic Design 2.0, because we need to have a paradigm shift in systemic design and tap into deeper sources of knowledge in systems thinking and some other disciplines. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I think I spoke about um, 30 minutes or a bit more than that. That allows us to have at least 20 minutes of questions and answers. I'll be very happy to respond to your questions and to hear your ideas and your comments. So please take it away. Thank you, Arash. Uh, you can stop me from sharing my screen because I have uh, my two monitors are now messed up. Uh, okay, let me see how to do that. But when I, while I'm doing that, I think Carolina yeah, I think I did. Yeah, so it's good. Okay, yeah, I saw a hand raised. Yeah, that's Hi, me. Thanks. Thank you so much. I, I guess it's 12 a.m. your time. <laughs> yeah, it's 10 past, actually. Yeah. Okay. So we are literally in tomorrow here. Yes, that's right. I feel very special right now. <laughs> thanks, guys. Um, yeah, so I really love it. I, um, I, I did my very best to hold space for all the different um, topics, content, elements that you brought to the table. And I think I've been really thinking about 
design from a place of embodiment because in order for me to be connected to the people I'm designing for and designing with, I need to be with within myself. I need to hold space for myself and I need to be embodied within myself. So from that place, I think one of the challenges that I've had is that when I step into an environment where the worldview is, is actually antithetical to the very process of designing for um, not just a solution, but an experience. And I know that you are challenging us to step in in an embodied way, in a human way, and to challenge the worldview. I guess I have failed. I have succeeded sometimes, but I have also failed. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't know if there are any particular suggestions that you have yeah. with respect to challenging in a safe way, the worldview that needs to be yeah. deconstructed, dissolved in order to move yeah. in, in an embodied way. Yeah, great, great question. Yes. Well, I don't have a very straightforward answer to this question as you um, may also expect. What I would say is that absolutely true you know the system of education that we experience is is largely biased towards thinking and sensation we memorize things a lot of things we do a lot of thinking but we are somehow far away from this feeling of embodiment that you mentioned to embody something and it's very this this feeling of this corporeal response you know uh, when when we when we encounter something wholesome and holistic the first thing that responds to it is our body, is not our mind. This is, this is something very important that I have experienced a lot. Whenever, when we get goosebumps, this is a corporeal response to something which is holistic, which is wholesome. And the word health also has um, a root that comes from um, the word whole. So there is something in us that um, somehow longs for is encounters with wholeness. But then around us, we have a lot of fragmentation happening in the way we think, in the way we divide things up, the ways uh, that we establish silos. And yeah, so I, I fully agree. You know, as an educator who does not accept to teach in silos, you know, I always want to teach multidisciplinary courses or transdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary courses. I really have a tough time being um, somehow categorized in different. So when I want to join a university, ask me, okay, which category does your course fit? Is it about personal development? Is it about strategy? Is it about leadership? Is it about finance? Say it's about none of them. And it's about all of them at the same time because it's transdisciplinary and it doesn't fit. So this feeling of not being able to fit is something that I also experienced this on a, on a daily basis. But what I did with that and how I personally acted upon that was that um, I started doing small things. Now, for instance, the, the courses that we started with Design Dissolve is an example of this. So um, I, I started running my own somehow show because some of, some of these ideas do not really fit within these systems that are pre-established and they have this bias towards that mode of thinking and people after a while identify with those assumptions that they have so once you once you challenge the assumption challenge the individual behind the assumption as well so it's not going to be easy the, a very good way i would say um, is to design it to manifest in an emergent way first of all in yourself if, if you can do no matter what in your personal life following these ideas that you have in terms of embodiment that is already a win so we cannot if you, if you achieve something personally, you know, there's, again, there is this great divide between personal and professional because this is a personal, you know, course for personal development. This is a course for professional development. For me, if you are in touch with something which is useful, it, manif it's, it manifests both in your personal and in your professional life. So what I would say is that start with basically your daily activities to see where there is a chance to, to use some of these ideas and principles. If not, um, if you can't find anything there, then most probably you can't uh, push things into and uh, let's say a more, let's say harsh professional environment, which could be 
antagonistic a little bit. So um, I would say start from personal life and then see what bit of work you can do professionally with, as a freelancer that could manifest that. And um, this could be a next step towards this. For something that, that helped me a lot in my life was being in touch with psychoanalysis. The psychoanalysis is systems thinking in the context of the psyche. Now the work I do as a psychoanalyst gives me that freedom to work in this silo-less world, in the world of relationships, you know? So that's pure joy for me. So sometimes you need to fine tune a little bit and, and find probably a space in which these ideas work better, no matter how small it is. But once you start putting them into practice in such settings, they are going to permeate different dimensions of your life. And at some point, it'll be very difficult for people not to notice, you know? Uh, without you trying to push the ideas, they will get noticed at some point. Because once you try to push them, these are these things are like hot plates. You should not hold them directly with your hands. You should have some cloth around them and approach them with a lining of, of some sort. So um, it's important that you have that in mind. So my suggestion is first, personal world. Second, small bits and pieces of professional activities that where you can see this embodiment emerging and then little by little see what that brings into the practice that you're doing as a designer. I hope that was is remotely useful. Yeah, no, I'm I'm totally following and I I I will continue to to move in the direction of emergence. Yeah. Um, because it does I am learning to be safe within myself as I move in, in this way, as I move, literally my body moves in this way. And as I begin to think in this way, yeah. um, and I have found that some people feel threatened by that, but yeah. I'm also needing to learn how to feel safe, even in the face of people feeling threatened and pushing back and just yeah. asserting my, asserting my, my space in a safe and, uh, in a safe and, uh, using this word loosely in a safe and loving right. way in a holistic yeah. way. It's a process. Amazing. Thank you. It's, it is. It's a journey, I would say. And I would highly recommend you to attend our webinar in two days about this uh, the designer's journey, because we talk about these things. We look at it from a uh, mythological point of view, where things are not the way that we are looked at in basically in business world, where they're sterile and that you know the feeling dimension the intuition is somehow sucked out of it so there's a richness that we can tap into why one once we can position ourselves in in a space which is uh like a space of mythology it can be really inspiring to us in the journeys that we are on and the type of tensions that we need to hold that we see that wow there there, there have been people before us who've done this so it's not just me it's it's something is a universal phenomenon. There has to be a journey. There has to be a quest. There has to be this uh, quest for the whole holy grail, the, the grail quest. It has a meaning. So I would recommend you to take part in that. Um, I will share the link with Kathleen after the session so that you can have more um, information about it. Thank you. You're welcome. Questions, comments, please. Yeah, there is a question about example of systemic, systemic versus um, systematic design. Yeah, there's, there's many examples I can give you. I can, um, I can give you an example from education. For instance, um, recently when we had the COVID coming up, it shook up the education space pretty seriously. And um, in, I, I attend a lot of faculty meetings, you know, I, I used to attend now, I, I'm not working as, in as many universities as I used to in the past. But in one of those faculty meetings, there was this um, problem by one of the faculty members that how can we administer multiple choice questions now that the students are not at the school physically? We can't do this anymore because when, once they're home, they can cheat, they can and you know, multiple choice questions, if you have 20 questions, if someone passes down 
five phone numbers, you know, it means at least, uh, you know, you can say that the whole uh, questions are answered. You can key them down to 235, 640, uh, 234, 131. It just shows that the, which question has which response. So they can simply cheat the students. So this was a problem. And then the systematic approach to solve it is that what they were um, proposing was to um, subcontract this startup that could lock the students' screens so that they could not go and send a message on their screens to someone else. So once they were on the exam page and that multiple choice question stuff, exam page, they could only do that and they can't do anything else. This is, you know, they're, we're talking about uh, students who are very um, digitally capable. I mean, imagine some something as stupid as this to stop students from cheating if they want to cheat. They have multiple devices. They can have other, you know, laptops or whatever else that they could do. So this is a systematic way of approaching this. We are given a problem. How do we solve this problem? Systemic way would be, all right, how can we design a, an exam for which, in which the students cannot cheat? That is a systemic design. So we design our exam so that the problem of um, cheating disappears or it dissolves. This is systemic design. And then you have to question the, the teacher who wants to come up with multiple choice questions now, you know, assessing the students like that. So that requires a shift or an upgrade in the mental model or the educational or pedagogical machinery of that, that educator. So when I say it's a journey of transforming mindsets and mental models, that's what I'm talking about. So it, he has to go through an upgrade to be able to come up with questions that you can give to the students a week before the exam, give them the questions. And then they can come back and with their responses, they can send the response. They don't even need to sit in an exam session. So this is a systemic way of approaching it. There's so many examples I can give you, but I would very much like you to start probing uh, deeper into the uh, type of problems that you need to solve to see if there's a way that you could redesign systems. Or as uh, we say in psychoanalysis, we don't solve problems, we outglow problems. So it's, the idea is not to solve something. If I have a tension with this guy, what do I do with him? This is basically trying to solve a problem you have with there's a, a lot of psychologies about problem solving, but what I like about psychoanalysis is about dissolving problems because it somehow goes to a level of depth that when you shift things at that level, then you outgrow problems. The problems are no longer relevant for you. So in the world of psychoanalysis, we can, we can, I can see it a lot that those people who create a lot of frustrations and tensions in your life is basically the, the, the root cause of those pro, uh, problems or tensions or frustrations are deeply embedded within you. It's not about them out there. It's about you in here that you need to somehow go in, into that and shift something down there so that in above, in the world of secondary effects, what I call our everyday lives is the world of secondary effects. So we need to go deep down to the, to the bottom and to the abyss. And then there by shifting things at the bottom of our souls, then this world of secondary effects changes as well. So this is, in my opinion, systemic design. It requires a knowledge of human being. And to begin with, a knowledge of the designer, some sort of a self-awareness of the designer needs to be there, you know? I hope this could answer that question. Any other? I just want to add one quick comment on this. Um, this is like, I remember you sharing this uh, example during your last talk when I met you. And this is the reason why I, you know, wanted to invite you here, especially I think as designers, uh, we were all often think about how we can reframe a problem. But throughout this whole time, we always talk about how can we do things. As an educator myself as well, I always tell 
students uh, they need to think about creative problem solving. But when you start introducing the concept of problem dissolving, that was like a new thing for me, even though we're just really shifting our mindset. And that's um, what I've been thinking through in my professional or personal work all these days, that how can we actually dissolve the problem, not just solve the problem. Um, yeah. But anyways, I just wanna drop this comment here. Yeah, and that's um, why we call ourselves design dissolve. So we design yeah. the dissolve, you know? Or we dissolve, yeah. we dissolve the problems through the process of design. And that is design for me. You know? I want to sum up design as an activity that results in dissolving problems. It's an activity that connects to emergences, the phenomenology of, let's say, services and these human activity systems around us. Design is a process that transforms mindsets, mental models. You know, So by the act of design, if it's true design, we become better human beings because it somehow helps us transform through that act, you know, generate some harmony between our inner and the outer world. That resonance needs to be there. So for me, there has to be a very important transformative effect that comes out of the design process for the designer and thus for the users. You know, if, if you did not basically change, you know, one thing I, one, one idea I have for my course is, this is designing for emergent is that if in that chat, in that course, I'm not challenged, if I do not learn something fundamentally new, you know, that course is not going to be a magical course. The magic is not going to be there, as simple as that. So it's um, necessary, but not sufficient. I need to be challenged in every course that I teach. That's why I switch at least 50% of the material of the courses that I give each time I give them. And when I don't do that, something inside me withers and fades and becomes so sad. And when I feel that sad inside me, how can I create joy for my students or the participants in the course? So these are type of designing for emergence, you know, some heuristics is the world of heuristics and ideas that are not clear cut. You need to experiment. It's a very experimental world. You know, this coming, coming to, uh, to contact with systemic design. It's a craft rather than a clear cut science for which we can have cookbooks or codified knowledge. It's iterative. We learn through cycles of iteration and observation that we do. And we need to assemble our own toolkit. It's not something that we can go and get some off the shelf type of thing. And one final rant that I wanna give is this era of mass or masses, mass people, mass production, you know, mass consumption has permeated our lives. It has permeated our system of education. We are looking into mass solutions to unique circumstances. So all these templates and canvases that, that we use, they do not address and respect the uniqueness of the design situations that we are confronting. So as first rule of design, we need to accept and respect those unique and idiosyncrasies that are in the design process. How can we do that if you're using something off the shelf? It's as if you want to create a fine dining experience by going to McDonald's. That doesn't work. That's that is eating for becoming full. But then we have eating as a process of nourishing our soul. That cannot happen with McDonald's. So remember this, this analogy in your mind and uh, stay as far away as possible from mass solutions and try to, instead of consuming tools and ideas, try to generate yours. Give it a try. Be a map maker, put ideas together and generate your own tools. This, this is the journey of systemic design things are unique you are unique circumstances yeah. are unique totally in agreement with you um i think we have a question from antonio here uh perhaps putting on your uh psychoanalytical hat on what do you believe to be limiting factors personal and perhaps structural for designers to shift from a systematic to systemic design uh, paradigm okay. very good question i would say um we, we want to be comfortable somehow at some point. We want to 
being in a world in which there is not much doubt or uncertainty. This is what we like to do. An animal acts out of impulses and instincts. They, didn't, they don't need to think. Something comes, they're hungry, they act upon it, they eat, they hunt, right? Something threatens them, they fight or flight, right? So these are impulses. And I think one thing that is taking us away from this space of systemic design is that we want to go back to that space where things are comfortable, where things, we have, a, we have an illusion of reducing uncertainty by using these canvases and methods that are out there, but we're not doing it actually. We create this illusion to feel comfortable. We cannot face, we don't like to face that uncertainty. And as a part of our journey of becoming unique individuals, we need to face that. This is the hero's journey, going to the unknown, facing those elements, those uncertainties, ambiguities, ambivalences, holding tensions. This is something that is not easy. We don't want to do it. And everything around us is designed in a way that we don't do it. From the system of education that we have that gives us exercises rather than real life experiences that we need to uh, basically gain to let's say the methods and ideas that we use in design, they all give us this illusion of being in a place where we have reduced uncertainty. But these methods are not methods to, to simplify ideas. They are simplistic. So there's difference between simplisticness and simplification of ideas. So we, we need to keep, in, keep it in mind. So in short, I would say, this is a difficult task. And I want to end this by a Sufi, because uh, originally I come from Iran and um, so Sufism has its roots in, um, let's say, Persian poetry comes from that. And there's this Sufi story of a man who had lost his keys and he was looking for them somewhere. And he was looking for it, looking for them for such a long time that it started attracting attention of other people. He said, dude, what are you looking for? He said, my keys, I never lost them. He said, where do you think you lost them? And he points out to a different corner and he asked him, why are you searching here if you have lost your keys there? He says, there it's dark. Here there is light. That's why I prefer to search for my keys here. So this is basically us as well. We don't want to go to the darkness. And the keys are there. Joseph Campbell says, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. So this is it. There's this fear that stops us and everything that is around us constructed stops us from taking that journey or saying yes to that journey. I think I've gone over time, Kathleen, and I'm, I'm still happy that people are, have stayed in the call. This is an accomplishment. So. Yeah, this is a huge accomplishment, but, um, <laughs> and I know it's getting really late on your end. Um, let's just see if, um, Anyone else has um, one, I don't know, last question? Because uh, it's like 12.30. Is it 12.30 on your end, right? A.M. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the man from the future now. Yes, you are. <laughs> I have the wisdom of the future. We're in your past. Yes. Um, Okay. <laughs> yes, the slides will be, uh, we, we, everything will be on our website and the link that Arash mentioned earlier, I will send it out through Meetup. Uh, so everyone uh, will be able to join uh, the webinar in two days. And, you know, and if you're interested in SBN course or other yeah. programs Arash is hosting, you will get the information. Mm -hmm. um, all right. I guess. Yeah, it was a pleasure to be able to talk. And I hope to see you in Design Design Love programs. We have great gathering of people join us there. Courses are very transformative for us, for the participants, for everyone, or join us in our, in our webinars. So thank you so much, everyone. Take care of yourselves and right. till later. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.